Welcome to the Thriving Musician Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with musician, speaker, and consultant Spencer List to hear stories of how professional musicians navigated the inevitable financial challenges that arise on the path to creative freedom and get insight from industry professionals on how to break through to the next level of your finances, career, and art. Now, here's your host, Spencer List. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Thriving Musician Podcast. Today I have two special guests in Mara Penitzer and Kate Simpson. They are creative partners who co-founded Dwellings Arts, a nonprofit dedicated to creating arts events that center work by artists who identify as women, non-binary, LGBTQ+, and or people of color, providing artist resources and paid performance opportunities safe and safer workplaces in the performing arts, and financially accessible workshops, retreats, residencies, and professional development for artists. They also perform together in music and poetry projects like The Grays and Dirty Words. They're both professional musicians and artists. I knew Mara from my time in college, and I'm just meeting Kate for the first time today. So I'm really looking forward to to all of you getting to know both of them and talking about all of these amazing topics that are super relevant in today's society. So welcome to the podcast, Mara and Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Great to chat with you. So for listeners who don't know who you are, could you give us a little bit more background on your personal story musically and or financially and kind of what you've gone through and lead us up to today. Yeah, so I can start. This is Mara. Um, Like you said, we met at UNT, so I was pursuing a career in in jazz piano performance at the time. Um, After that, I moved to Western Mass, which is where Kate and I are based now. Um, Went to grad school for for composition. Um, And yeah, kind of always had to have another job um, yeah. to support what I was doing musically. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, became an AmeriCorps member. So I did that for a year and a half at a, a music school um, that has an El Sistema inspired uh, program. So they go into public schools, um, they bring like professional musicians uh, and like teaching artists. Um, into the public school. So that was a really cool experience and kind of led me um, to be interested in social work. So right now I'm, I'm pursuing a social work degree, um, which I'm really excited about. But I think that that, um, that kind of path of both music and social work um, led into this project that Kate and I are working on now. Very cool. Yeah. And um, I'm from Western Mass. So I grew up here. I met Mara when we were both in school at UMass. Um, I started at a community college for jazz voice. And then when I transferred to UMass, I started in the music program and I ended up transferring to women, gender and sexuality studies, but they still used my music credits because my focus was performance activism. Um, So that's my schooling. Um, And since then, you know, I've been performing around the, the area with my jazz group and my poetry group and our indie rock group. Um, And I think, you know, my background and a lot of things that I was doing was organizing fundraisers and finding ways to support the local community with my art. Um, Mm -hmm. And like Mara, I've always had to work another job um, to sustain, you know, that life as well. Right now I'm working as a marketing director at a music venue in Holyoke. Um, which is interesting because before this point I was always working like service jobs while I was making my music and everything. And that's kind of where we're at. We started Dwellings um, after a few conversations. You know, Mara and I, our main project, The Grays, is the two of us and two men. There's four of us. And there were a couple gigs where, you know, I noticed and we noticed that we just get treated differently than our bandmates. Um, I do, you know, the majority of the management and the booking and everything. Um, But when it comes down to how we're treated by venue owners or people in that space, that was never like reflected. Like we've been shorted $100 at gigs. Um, 
things like that. We've been touched ways you didn't want to be touched. So yeah, so we just started having these conversations and I think it started as an idea of this festival. And the more we talked and the more we worked on it, um, it became clear that we wanted it to be something bigger than that, something more than that. And that's kind of how dwellings came to be. Yeah. Wow. So there's a lot for us to dive into and drill into here because, I mean, there's the money side of things, but then there's also the way you're being treated for the gender differences and, and then your personal experiences. Okay, before we get into the organization and the festival, I want to know a little bit about, like, obviously, you both have been dealing with this all of your lives, right? It's not something, something that just started like yeah. this year. This, this has been happening. This is such a broad question, but I want to kind of know how your thought process was like in terms of how you viewed like making a living, earning income while simultaneously dealing with some of the things you've already touched on, maybe from college until now. Um, I want to know a little bit more about what that's like. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, in college, I was I was really compartmentalizing and not Mm. processing the gender stuff that was going on um so really yeah and I think I I was trying to make a career out of music and Mm -hmm. I think I didn't recognize that the impact even the psychological impact that uh yeah that sexism and not feeling like represented in the the local music scene was having um you know, when I was in Denton, um, I did have a piano teacher who would like make jokes about me playing like a girl. Um, wow. And like, you know, I feel like that impacts your, uh, your motivation to put yourself out there and like try to find gigs or try to be a leader. Um, you know, when somebody's judging your musical ability by your identity that you can't change. Um, right. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think that the festival has been really great in that, um, you know, we we both have a chance to process these things that have been going on for a long time, but also try yeah. to um, make it make our scene better for for other women or non-binary or genderqueer people. Um, you know, we're trying to to pay people more than we get paid in the local mm-hmm. scene and treat them respectfully. So I think, I think just having a chance to process like the emotional impact of what was happening um, leads us to, to consider like the financial uh, intersection of that. Right. It's like, you're, you're not really thinking about that while it's happening. You're om- yeah. you're having to go back and kind of relive. Oh, this yeah. was affecting me, not just, like you said, psychologically, but I mean, I can imagine that can affect how you value yourself. So if you're going to maybe go get a gig and I've heard stories from other people like this where, okay, if you're a female and you show up as the the band leader and the venue tries to pay you less and things like that. But if it's like ingrained in you over the years, then maybe you might start to believe that. And that's really it's really unfortunate. Yeah, and I feel like the experience also of being like the only woman in a band can impact that. Like, obviously, I've had great experiences with with male colleagues who, and good collaborative relationships, but I've also been in situations where I'm the only woman, and some stuff is being said that is not okay with me. But you know, do I want to work with this band again? Right. Is the question. Oh, and there's so many decisions you're constantly having yeah. to make. Like, do I say something? do I work, want to work with these people? And like, what am I willing to put up with? Which, you know, is insane that you have to make that choice. I've been in many situations where I am in a band and let's say you or someone else is the only female in the band. And I've seen that happen where things are being said. It's interesting because I mean, I'm a male, so it's, I don't have the same perspective, but I grew up around a lot of females and, um, so I don't know, I guess I have maybe some more, I have the aura, I, I don't know how what to call it, but, um, you know, I, I could see it happening and I didn't really know what to do. And so I kind of want to know a little bit more about, for someone like me who has some sort of awareness in those situations, 
And like, let's say you're in the band with me and I see you because I mean, it's just happened too often where we're in the green room and some of the other males are saying inappropriate things or they're saying things that are more like, I don't know what to call them, but like they're not, they don't really realize that what they're saying is, you know, really talking down to females or other genders. And it's like I'm having to make a similar decision. Not the same, but I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Because I've been in those situations a lot. I think it's just like, you know, starting those conversations and, and, you know, taking time for accountability, which doesn't happen until you start to like talk about these things and think about these things, obviously. Yeah. A big thing that we're doing right now that I think relates to this is our call to action for venues, which is just like a basic moral agreement, I think. And I think that in projects, you can have a similar thing, you know, Um, our project, (laughs) I write predominantly about mental health and identity. So by virtue of that, like that's pretty open in our space. Right. But that is not the case for, for many bands, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think, and that's something we had to learn, you know, the, the gig that we got shorted a hundred dollars was the same gig that my, one of our other creative partners, he didn't know what to do in that situation. Cause they were just talking down to me. He had never been put in that situation, but since then we've had conversations mm-hmm. and I think, um, you know, the difference between like men that identify as men um and bands is that a lot of them haven't had to think about these things whereas like as a woman in a band there's no escape it's, it's, you know there's no escaping that reality and i think it's just starting to kind of tune into those things and and just basic things that once you think about it they're things you already know like i mean standing up for someone obviously if they're being talked down to in a way that you know doesn't like suit their professionalism but also just like at gigs being very aware like yeah, maybe there's one woman in your band, but more often than not, like Mar and I are the only women on the bill for five bands on a lineup, you know, Mm -hmm. being aware of those things and like trying to be more cognizant if you have a part in the booking or or building those spaces, I guess. Would you say that it's appropriate? So let's say this happens and I see it happening and I want to say something to her. Is that appropriate to say maybe afterwards, you know, maybe just just us aside away from everyone else and say, hey, you know, I noticed this was happening. I don't think that's appropriate. And I just want to, I don't know, say something to them as like, a, I see that this is happening almost just like a, I'm with you. But is that appropriate? Oh, or absolutely. some form of that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um I feel like one of the weird things about being the only woman in a band is like not having those experiences feel like seen or validated when nobody does anything. Yeah. Yeah. So like, um, and yeah, you know, I've been in situations where that stuff is happening and I haven't spoken out. Um, and I don't, I don't expect like, you know, if you want to be an ally, it doesn't have to be a huge confrontation with a person saying something sexist. It could be, like a small comment it could be noticing and you know acknowledging that not that's going laughing on. with them either yeah but I do think though you know that there is some sort of responsibility with pi- within power dynamics yeah and by being an ally again like Mara said I don't think you have to confront anyone by any means but I think it is important to recognize that you know I'm at a I feel like I'm at a point in my life where I'm like in a lot of situations I can be confrontational but I haven't always been that way Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I don't want to feel like someone's taking care of me, but it's just being seen. And I think what you're saying, you know, even just checking in with someone, obviously, if it's a situation that like, you really should step in and like, at least have their back in that moment. I think that that's appropriate. But I think checking in can be really powerful. And at least for that person, make them feel like they're not alone in that place, you know? Yeah, and then you kind of work together to say, like, okay, what's our next step, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, if it wasn't necessarily in the moment. I just wanted to add to what Kate was saying about the power dynamic, and, like, I feel like at times it can also be easier for men who are, like, saying these things, or people who are saying these things to 
you hear it from another man you know what I mean yeah and it's not necessarily men I mean this also comes down to age right um obviously like in certain situations race or anything like that yeah Mar and I have had long conversations about how age plays into into things like this just in how we're Mm -hmm. structuring our own organization right you know um so real quick on the flip side of what I was talking about and I'm imagining maybe a listener's thinking this too is okay I want to say something I want to check in with that person I want to show them that I'm there um but there's parts of me that think well maybe my hesitation is because maybe that person doesn't see it that way and I don't want to like put a blanket assumption on that person that they're bothered by it because and I also don't want to assume that that person enjoys what the people were saying and I don't want to say that maybe there are women or people that enjoy that kind of power dynamic but I would have to say with seven billion people on the planet there might be, and maybe that's a cause of other issues going on. I'm not assuming that that's healthy, but also I don't want to be the person that maybe assumes that, and then I get the the opposite reaction that's like, you know, I don't need your help or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think, you know, that is a risk. You know, somebody might not need your help, but I think no matter what, these power dynamics are real. Yeah, the structure, I agree. You know, this, these systems are real. So I think, you know, you don't have to, again, you don't have to like coddle people. We're all adults and like we're all mm-hmm. doing this professionally. And and that's part yeah. of respect, yeah. you know, like that's part of professional respect. But I think it's just choosing to be, choosing to allow that person to fill a space the same way that you do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe somebody really doesn't want somebody to pitch in for them, but that still could be also very embedded in those power dynamics and how they. Right. Exactly. Exactly. But I think, you know, speaking to that, the best thing you can do is just like, not be assumptive, just be like, Hey, I noticed what they were saying was sexist. You cool with that? Like, you know, right. Right. I mean, every person in every situation is different. And I totally, some of the best things that we can do is just think about these things and like, let them be part of our framework. Definitely. So just like having conversations, I'm thinking of another example, I you know, I can only talk from my experience, but another band I play with quite frequently, they are all world class musicians. Mm -hmm. And I am one of the only um, non uh, people of color in the in the band. And we have conversations about this stuff, Mm -hmm. because they're very open about how they're treated. We've had situations where we're out in the country. Um, and they feel unsafe Mm -hmm. completely everyone in the band. And it's, it's weird. Um, you know, me going out there and not feeling that way. And for them, one of them had driven to the wrong address by accident and he pulled into this driveway and the person came out of the house and he, you know, and he's telling the story and everyone else in the band is like, you better get back in that car and get out of there as soon as you can. And it's really sad and really unfortunate. And also, I know they get treated differently by guests at the gig. And um, a lot of the things we do are private events and stuff. And so what I've tried to do is to just have conversations with them all the time. Not like I'm bringing it up, but an example would be like I visited Memphis a few months ago. And I went to the Martin Luther King Museum, which is incredible. It's at the Lorraine Motel where he was assassinated. And I had this insane experience and I shared that with them. And I'll just share the experience because I think everyone should hear this. I was walking through the museum and there was an African-American mother with her two kids nearby. And um, they were sitting in, there was like a a recreation of the jail cell. I don't know if it was Birmingham. I can't remember one of the jail cells that he was in. He wrote a letter from Mm -hmm. and they had kind of a replica of it that you could go into And so they were kind of just taking a break, sitting down. It was the mom and two kids. And the mom is explaining to them, you know, they're learning about all these things. And she's saying, so this is what we had to go through to have the right to do this, this, and this. And it's funny how the museum was incredibly powerful. But this moment where I'm seeing this family and I'm seeing these kids and I'm thinking, 
my parents never told me something like that. I, di- I didn't grow up being taught that this power dynamic existed because they're not necessarily, I'm sure they are experiencing it in some way as children, but when you're growing up, you don't really think that that kind of stuff's going on. So having a parent tell you that, that's going to be with you forever, right? And it's great because they're learning and that stuff, but it just hit me really hard. And um, so I shared that with the band. And uh, it's interesting because we've talked about other things too in other instances, but I've noticed even since then, like our relationship has grown stronger and I feel like more connected to them. And I, I believe that they do too. So would you say that just by having conversations and sharing experiences and like, that might be another way to like show that you're an ally without, you know, like bringing it up bluntly and just kind of saying standard kind of repertoire. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think being an ally is constantly bringing up race or gender. Right. Any any means, but I do think like you, like being vulnerable with people and being open to hearing other people's experiences. And also I think it's important that, you know, we recognize that you didn't have to have those conversations when you were a kid and and the acknowledgement that like, I mean, I think that's something we should be aiming for. We're adults, but we're still growing, you know, yeah. uh, Mara and I are very progressive people. And, you know, my mom didn't teach me a lot of this, but she was an open person and mm-hmm. I consider myself lucky. There's people that maybe don't start thinking about this stuff till they're 45, but you still want them to think about these things and open themselves up because that literally unlocks a whole different side of humanity, I think. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I think being a good ally is just showing up for people. Whatever yeah. that means. And that literally could just mean like having open conversations. And, and most of the time it means listening. You know, yeah. an ally doesn't have to insert themselves into other people's identities by any means. They shouldn't. But I think it's mm-hmm. again, it's just showing up. Yeah. And I think this speaks to like our or values in our organization of, um, you know, thinking, thinking really intentionally about booking, um, because you wouldn't be having those conversations if, if you weren't in that band. So like the more, the more diverse our lineups can be, the more diverse our bands can be, mm-hmm. the more likely we are to be having those conversations. Um, right. Putting them in the same room just yeah. offers that opportunity. Yeah. I think that's brilliant because I can imagine some people thinking, well, what if I don't, what if I just want to play with who I want to play with and that kind of stuff? But what you just said, I've never heard before. So, and I think that's really cool. It's like the, the idea isn't just to like, it's almost like when you think of companies who are hiring, like, and they need to have a diverse amount of people and it's almost like a numbers game. And that kind of sounds silly and unfortunate to me. But what you're saying is, it's not necessarily about like, we need to have this many of this and this and this, and they need to, you know, we need to have equal representation, which is important. But what you're saying is kind of going a step beyond that is that's going to allow for opportunities for people to connect and understand each other and learn more about each other's cultures or the way they think or, you know, et cetera. And I think that's really powerful. I think that's really, really cool. And I also think, you know, to speak to that, it's, it's not like when we talk about needing to see more diversity in the workplace, that it's about filling numbers or it shouldn't be. I agree. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be. And that's what we've talked about a lot. Booking a lot of women or, or non-binary people, people of co- or people of color isn't out of wanting to fill that quota. It's because there's so many amazing, talented artists that already exist, even in the Valley, mm-hmm. you know, we get touted as like the super progressive place, but that's really only with sexuality and gender when you think about it. Mm-hmm. There's still a lot of a lot of issues. I mean, actually, even surrounding gender, but yeah. specifically race in this area. There's no shortage of amazing artists that could be on these lineups. And and I think you know through this process, we've come into contact with so many people that like would have fit better on our past lineups than what we were playing with, just because what was in our immediate vicinity, what we thought at least at the time, mm-hmm. you know. And that goes back to like our bands that are like majority white men more likely to put themselves out there and I mean it comes down to I mean this can I think relate back to the workplace who feels like they have the space to speak up in a meeting which is like a silly little comparison I think but I think that that's that equates to a band 
full of people that have always had certain opportunities and maybe not even opportunities. Cause I think that that can be assumptive of class and everything, but opportunities in the sense of like, again, the space being made and what you see when you look at a lineup. Um, those people are way more comfortable sending out the email to get on that lineup or being a part of the, the battle of the bands and, and having all their friends come out and vote for them. I think, you know? Yeah. Wow. I'm, I really love this. So can we talk a little bit more about the nonprofit and then we'll talk about the festival. So when did you start Dwellings Arts? January, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, of this year, 2019? Yeah. Yeah. We, awesome. um, yeah, because our gig was in December, right? I think our gig was at the end of December, or early January at yeah. Bishops. And that's when we had some oh, things. Yeah. Not that, I mean, Mara and I, you know, Mara's been officially in the Grays for two or three years, two yeah. years, three yeah, years. I don't know. Three years now. It's been a long time. So things have happened over time, but this tipping point yeah. um, happened in December. And Mara and I, I don't even, I think we just decided to meet and talk about the festival and it just grew from there. We see each other like two or three times a week now, you know? Um, and it got big, you know, we got really lucky. We reached out to some friends and acquaintances that are also working in the arts that are also social workers. One of them works in the medical field. Um, and they're all, you know, two of them are musicians. One's a photographer and he's a dancer. And we started talking about making a nonprofit and only one of them has experience in a nonprofit, but we're all, you know, one of them's a very active activist and they're all very experienced in their own ways. And I think we just got really lucky to start working with this kind of unique group of people that have been really into helping us. We also, you know, have made time to talk to people like this woman, Moggy, who we adore, who's, um, you know, I don't know how old she is, um, but she's been working in music for probably... 50 or 60 yeah. years, you know, wow. um, making, you know, building DIY spaces. She's super anti-establishment. And I think it's just opened up the door to us to speak to other people that are kind of um, accessing these ideas or have been, you know, longer mm-hmm. than us and how we can kind of build on that. So tell me more about the name Dwellings Arts. So um, as you know, I, I'm really into Emily Dickinson um, uh-huh. and Kate and I work on a poetry project together. So that's super present in, in our work anyway. Um, one of the venues we were initially looking at for, for this festival was the Emily Dickinson Museum. We had actually yeah. built, we had kind of built the original idea of the festival around the Emily Dickinson Museum. Yeah, and our logo is actually um, flowers from Emily Dickinson's herbarium. Um, awesome. Yeah, but- Our artist was a distant relative of Emily Dickinson, yeah. so he says. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so lots of Emily Dickinson connections. Yeah. There. Okay. But um, yeah, she uses the word dwellings or dwell a lot of the time in mm-hmm. in a lot of different ways, like dwelling on an idea or like a physical place. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, there's a specific poem, I Dwell in Possibility, that's talking about you know, imagining a better space uh, yeah. through poetry. Um, so, yeah. I, I love that. Mara came up with the name, but that's, without even hearing that quote, that was very much, I guess, dwellings in relation to space. I yeah. feel like yeah. it's space so much, but I think that that's so prevalent in this. Can you talk a little bit more about what the festival looks like? Yeah, definitely. Um, I can start. So we have uh poetry stage we have a music stage we have a workshop room and then we have an outdoor like kind of flex stage um and it's going to be from 1 p.m to 11 it's going to be an all-day thing and we're featuring some local artists we have some touring people coming out that we just love um and then we have you know makers and vendors we're trying to support the local scene as much and also we've been fundraising and looking for grants um because with all of these artists and being, you know, devoted to paying them, we also are very devoted to making the tickets accessible. Yeah. Because, you know, even though there are some themes that like may be appropriate for certain ages in this lineup, I still think that all of this like knowledge that can be accessed, especially in the workshops and some of the performances, like it should be available to anybody who's interested in learning. Yeah. Um, and we, we booked some great artists. Yeah, I know probably a lot of your listeners are, are 
interested in jazz. So a couple of really exciting jazz artists that we have coming are, are Wendy Eisenberg um, and Rajna Swaminathan, uh, her trio. So that's really exciting to have those, those artists. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and then one of my absolute favorite poets um, who, you know, whose books I love and I just happened to see them recently at the venue that I work for and then just like offhand reached out not thinking that they would ever be interested in this um Clementine Von Radix they've won a bunch of awards in poetry and you know they have really successful books they just released a book um but they're coming out from New York for us and the workshops like you know we have workshops on white fragility and we also have workshops on black femme survival um and you know locating yourself through performance art and you have this really cool martial arts spoken word performance piece that will also result in a workshop so there's kind of something wow. for everyone. yeah we have some youth activists coming out to talk about you know balancing like kind of what you were talking about earlier like not knowing when when is the time to be an activist and when is the time to take care of yourself and mm-hmm. balancing that when you're also in high school um wow and that's you know that's from the perspective of being students of color who are being taught by predominantly white teachers yeah and you know that's not something that a lot of people i mean that non-people of color have to think about those dynamics and being so young and having certain things ingrained in you like that um so that's that's one of the parts I'm really excited for is the youth workshops, but we also have some young poets that have made national news oh, recently yeah. um, that are just from Holyoke, a town over that, um, you know, are young people talking about race and identity. And it got national attention because of how their city reacted. Um, that's yeah. Mishi Serrano, and she's incredible. Um, she's going to be performing. We're really excited. This this wow. line is kind of, you know over the course of a few months we've been chipping away at it and it's it's pretty finished now we're gonna even have like an open mic space because we hope that people will come and be inspired and then share what they you know what they can bring out as well yeah i was gonna ask about that like is there gonna be places for people to like have just conversations it's not necessarily a workshop but will the artists be involved too and kind of have like this shared community space to talk well actually one of the things that we're doing that isn't necessarily a workshop is, um, and this is something that, you know, I can't speak for both of us, but I believe Mara and I both experience is we're going to have an open conversation on performance anxiety and anxiety as it relates to, you know, how that impacts your professional or creative or personal life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, sorry, no, you're good. And, and I think like, yeah, sexism is a huge stressor when you're already experiencing anxiety or performance anxiety. Um, Certainly. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's important. And, and, you know, I think our hope for that is that, you know, we're both going to participate in that conversation. We hope the audi- audience will participate. And we also, you know, we know that some of our artists that are performing are interested as well. So I think, I think that can be really special about a music experience for the audience and the artists. And it feels like everyone's kind of building this thing together. Yeah. And I think that that's more of what we want to see in the art scene. Wow. So when you when you brought that up, I immediately thought of Miranda George. She's the first person I interviewed on this podcast. Mara, I don't know if you knew her very well in school. I did, um, but I heard her play, yeah, frequently. Great. Yeah, she does a bunch of she's she's like uh, the Brene Brown for musicians. She talks about performance anxiety, shame, and all that stuff. And she's spoken at South by Southwest and Midwest and all that stuff. So maybe down the line. You, you you should connect Definitely. together for sure uh, but for listeners she was on the very first episode i believe or it was the second episode technically the first guest if you haven't listened to that she talks about her experience and she had insane performance anxiety and she realized you know all these things and it's an amazing story anyways so i just thought of that when y'all brought that up so that's really cool um i'm Really excited for you both for this and for everyone who's going to be involved and and the waves that it will make because, I mean, even if 10 people were there, that's like, that's 10 people who then would, you know, share that with another 10 or another 20. And it's going to be more than that. But you know what I mean? It's just, you're going to, just by doing this and creating the place 
for people to talk about it and feel okay. Maybe sharing their story and learning from other people who have strategies. I think it's amazing. So thank you for doing it. So I want to add that another way that we're trying to involve um, audiences and just the local arts community in general is um, we have a couple of calls for work um, for local artists. So um, for those in, in Western Mass, um, right now we have a call for young poets to be featured at the festival. Um, and we also are uh, seeking works from you know visual artists or poets, short stories, um, basically anything, scores, lyrics, um, to, to compile into an anthology um, with the idea being, you know, we would print the anthology, give artists their own copies to sell. For themselves. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the ones that we sold would go towards yeah. um, dwellings, you know, scholarship work or, or more events or um, even another benefit, you know, to be determined at a different day, but something that would involve what's, what, what dwellings is doing with the arts. Mm -hmm. So if there was one piece of advice you would leave our listeners, what would that be? You know, I think for me, for yourself, I think just feeling that you're allowed to build the space that you need in your arts community and that you're allowed to, in that, ask for what you believe is your value. Um, I think that all is kind of one thing. Um, and, and then, you know, also I think that you're allowed to ask other people to show up for you. You know, I think that builds a big picture. Yeah, I would say, I would say my advice is, you know, take, take a look at who you're playing with or what shows you're going to see, first of all, um, and reflect on it. But also, you know, take a look around your community and kind of like say, what resources are there? You know, who do I know who, I could collaborate with to make an arts community that I want in, yeah. in my town, you know, mm -hmm. like we, we found a lot of great local business sponsors that are supporting this project. Um, so yeah, there's, there's support out there if you want to create something like this. So did you feel like before you kind of started looking to build this space in your community that it was there? Or, I mean, did you, did you think, I know it's out there, I just need to find it? What was your experience with that? Uh, it's, I feel like it's a layered question because I think some of the artists that are from the local area that are in this festival are proof that it was there at a yeah. very, you know, at a personal level. But I think it's a bigger community issue. You know, I think when you take a look at, at the Valley scene, you know, people say how great the art scene is, but there's mm. definitely a need for this kind of work or more, mm -hmm. of it, or at least it coming together to create more of a movement and a norm. Yeah. Yeah. And like Kate said, we've met so many incredible artists and community members um, and audience members just like through doing this. So I think, yeah, I think it's there, but maybe, maybe some more connecting. Um, yeah. We'll make it stronger. Yeah, I asked because I immediately thought about thriving musician community and how I knew that there were other people out there who wanted to improve their personal finances, but also their mental health and self-awareness and increase their income and all these things and some of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, and I realized, and when I started doing it, they all started coming out of the woodwork. It's like they were there the whole time. And it's really interesting that from my experience, I realized that there were people that I was around, even in college, that not on purpose, but I just hadn't really connected with in college. And then 10 years later, we're talking about these things. And, uh, and a good example is Emily Merrill. I also interviewed her. I can't remember the episode. Uh, but... She's someone who we just didn't cross paths at school for various reasons. Um, and here we are, and we, we did this interview, and we're like almost the same person in terms of how we think about these things. And of course, there's a part of me that's like, oh, what a missed opportunity. But at the same time, it's really comforting to know that there are 
people out there in whatever community that you want, they're there. So I liked, Mara, what you said about kind of like look around, what do you want your community to look like? And I think it is just a matter of, of going out there and finding them because I do believe that they're there. No matter where you live, who you are, and what you want out of life. Um, so that's my experience. Um, so for listeners, how can they learn more about Dwellings Arts and the festival and or get in touch with either one of you? Yeah, so you can visit our website, dwellingsarts.com. Um, you can also follow us on any social media at Dwellings Arts. Um, and then you can email us if you have any questions or want to be involved, um, dwellingsarts at gmail.com. And if you go on our website, there's all sorts of, you know, there's ways that you can volunteer or or like Mara said, you can send in works. And even though right now we're focusing on local submissions, there might be a time in the future where we want to open that up to a bigger, a bigger span. Um, But again, yeah, dwellingsarts.com. You can kind of see everything that we're doing. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for talking to me about these really important issues and for doing what you're doing. Thank you for having us. It was great. Of course. So for those of you listening, I hope that this was insightful and helpful to you. These topics are really important. And I hope that you found some resources and look into the work that they're doing to learn more. And I hope you all have a great day. Keep thriving. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of financial and creative freedom? Check out the leading financial blog for musicians at spencerlist.com, where Spencer covers the latest trends and financial strategies. And by signing up for the Thriving Musician newsletter, you can earn exclusive member content and discounts. Get it all at www.spencerlist.com. If you would like to nominate a thriving musician for an interview on the podcast, request Spencer to speak at your school or event, or want to submit questions or comments, please send an email to spencer at spencerlist.com. And keep thriving.